A lot of talk of change this morning, isn't there? Dave uh, unpacks for, for the kids. Who is it that brings about change? It's God. God's the one that has to bring change to the human heart. I want us to talk about what this looks like and what it looks like in one specific example in the, in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Luke. But before I do that, I want to start off with just talking about this whole subject of change. And I want to ask you this. What is your gut reaction to change, usually? If you're anything like me, I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, I have to say, I usually go through at least a few of the stages of grief when I am faced with change. Denial, anger, blaming, you know, all those kinds of things. But you know, God views change differently than we do, I think. The Bible tells us God himself does not change, but he certainly brings about change a lot in the world around us, doesn't he? Dave mentioned the seasons, how God has designed our world to operate in a way where there's this constant change, renewal. Take a walk in the woods sometime and you'll see, you'll see dead trees down everywhere, but beside them, new life springing up. God bringing about change in, out in nature. We, we see changes in our own bodies over the years as we age. And those changes become less and less welcome the older we get, right? Can't do everything that I used to do. My hip just doesn't work that way anymore, so the doctor's going to give me a bionic one or something like that. Thank the Lord for doctors who are able to help us with some of those things. But we can't, we can't stop all the change in our lives. In case you haven't noticed, our church family is going through a change. We have a leadership transition going on right now. Pastor Howard retires at the end of the month. That is a massive change. Over the next month, on Sunday mornings, we're going to be talking about this subject of change. And for these first two weeks, we're going to talk about what, what does it mean, what does it look like when God brings about change on an individual level. And so today we talk about the heart. In the weeks to come, Pastor Hart will be talking about what, is it, what does it mean, what does it look like, how does God do things when he brings about change on a corporate level? And we'll see, see that as well. But today, I'm talking about the most personal change that God brings about, and that's the, the change to our hearts. You see, God is in the business of changing hearts. And our scripture passage today gives us an example of what that looks like. So if you haven't already turned there, turn to Luke chapter 5. The passage we read from earlier. We want to talk about this morning what did it look like when God brought about change, especially in the heart of Peter, and first calling Peter to follow Jesus. And, and as we're turning there, I want to I want to kind of talk about the big picture of what Luke is doing here, because each of the gospel writers, as they're as they're writing the account of of what Jesus said and did and, and, and what his life looked like. They're telling these stories in order to make a point, in order to lead up to, ultimately, Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. But they're making a point about who Jesus is and what he has come to do. And Luke here, as we approach Luke chapter 5, it comes on the back of, of Jesus, first of all, getting rejected in his hometown of Nazareth, but then going and healing different people and speaking in synagogues. And the thing that you keep seeing, the word that you keep seeing over and over again is authority. That Jesus spoke as one who had authority and he demonstrated that authority over the demons and over the sicknesses and, and all these other kinds of things. And so as we get to Luke chapter 5, it's Jesus calling the disciples to follow him, especially Peter. It kind of zeroes in on Peter, most of the dialogue between Jesus and Peter. And, and the point that Luke is 
is ultimately drive across that Jesus is the one who has the authority. Jesus is the one who has authority over the demons, over the, over the sicknesses, and now he's going to show how he has authority over nature itself, and therefore he has authority over Peter. He has, Jesus has the right to call Peter to follow him, to live differently, to be changed. So we're talking about Jesus bringing, uh, God bringing about change in the human heart. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to see in this story of Luke chapter 5 the way that Jesus acts in some way, and then Peter responds. So Jesus, as we go through the story, it's constantly back and forth. Jesus does this, and Peter responds. Notice the one who is taking the initiative. Notice the one who has the authority in this situation. It's Jesus who acts, and Peter simply responds to him. We begin with the first four verses. On one occasion, it says, while the crowd was pressing on him to hear the word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. This is in the area of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them were washing their nets, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's. He asked him to put out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. What, what's the first thing that you notice Jesus doing here? He's initiating a conversation with, with Simon Peter. And it's, it's kind of subtle at first. He says, Peter, I want to use your boat to teach from the lake. And, and this is a natural thing that would happen. We have other accounts of Jesus teaching from a boat on a lake because your voice carries across the water. When you've got a huge crowd of people that are crowding into you, how do you, first of all, establish some distance so they're not just like bombarding you and, and crushing you underneath a, a stampede? Well, you get out on the water where they can't swim out to get you. But also, how do you make sure that they can all hear you? You, you go out on the water, your voice carries, and the people could listen to Jesus' teaching. But Jesus goes beyond that. He then initiates almost like a, almost like a challenge. It's not really a challenge, but he makes a request. He makes two requests to Peter. The first one is, put your boat out a little way so I can teach. And then when he had finished teaching, he makes another request of Peter. This one, kind of unbelievable. When he had finished speaking, he said the sign in verse 4, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now what is Jesus' profession? According to everyone that would have known him at the time, anybody that knew anything about Jesus at that time, they would have thought of him as a carpenter. Right? How much do carpenters know about fishing? Probably not too much, at least not in Peter's mind. What is Peter's profession? He's a fisherman. And here's Jesus, the carpenter, telling him, go out into the deep and put down your nets for a catch. And it's in the middle of the day. And Peter knows, because he's a fisherman, he's been doing this for a long time, he knows that you fish on the shore, along the shore in the shallows during the warm part of the day. And at night is when you go out into the deep. And you put it and you cast out your nets and you try to drag them up from the deep, right? And Peter, you can hear kind of, you, you hear Peter's response that there's this, this sense of kind of irony or, well, let's just read it. <laughs> Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. We were fishing at the time when you're supposed to fish in the deep, and nothing happened. You really think something's going to happen now? But because you said so, at your word, I will let down the nets. What's Peter's response when Jesus initiates this, this request? He obeys. Jesus is showing us here something about what it looks like when God seeks to bring about change. And the first thing that we see here is that God initiates change in our hearts. God does not wait for us, and thank God that he didn't wait for us. The Bible says in Romans 5, chapter 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, we weren't seeking for him Christ died for us. 
God initiates. He is the one who stands at the door and knocks, as, as the, the men's ministry, uh, or the, the men's uh, Sunday school class we were talking about in uh, Romans this morning. God is the one who has the authority and shows the initiative to reach out to us. And we are the ones who have an opportunity to respond. To respond to his action of reaching out. At some level, Peter recognized Jesus' authority already. This isn't the first time Peter ever met Jesus. We, we learn in John uh, chapter 1, verses 42 and 44, that Peter's brother Andrew had introduced him to Jesus earlier, a little bit earlier in Jesus' ministry. And so Peter already knows something about this great teacher and some of the things that he had been doing. But this is, this is the first time that, that he's really, that Jesus is kind of stepping on Peter's turf <laughs> and really doing something directly in, Peter, uh, in, in Peter's context. Peter obeys Jesus, even though he can't know for sure that anything's going to happen. In fact, he probably assumes that nothing would happen. That Jesus might look like a fool. He says, because you said so, I will go. I, I, I'm willing to trust you. I'm willing to be obedient to you, even though I know better. Does the authority of our Lord drive you to obedience, even when you don't think his way will work? Does, does Jesus ever ask things of you that you say, that has nothing? What's the point? Could it be that when God asks the seemingly impossible from us, he's actually seeking to bring about change in our hearts? Change at a heart level. Jesus wasn't just asking Peter to do something on a whim. He has purpose here. He was initiating this small step of faith in Peter in order to do something else. But what is this thing that Jesus is doing? Beyond just initiating, what, what is involved in that action? Well, it is revealing. Jesus is seeking to reveal something about himself and about Peter. Look again at verses 4 and following. Jesus asked Peter, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they closed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And when they came and filled both boats, or they, yeah, both of the boats, they began to sink. Do you get the picture? The fish. <laughs> This, this is not just like, oh, look at that. You randomly managed to, to find a little school of fish somewhere. You know, that was lucky. No, this is a demonstration of who Jesus is. That he has the authority to command what feels like all the fish in the whole sea to, to climb into those nets. And the boats are starting to sink because they can't even handle the amount of fish that they caught Jesus stepped onto Peter's turf and demonstrated his authority over the things that Peter relied on for his vocation. He was speaking to Peter in a language that Peter would understand. You want to know who I am? You want to know my power? I'm going to show you something that you can't deny because you're an expert in this. And you're going to see it for what it really is. You're going to see me for who I really am. Jesus was showing Peter in a way that Peter would, would recognize right away who he really was. But he wasn't just revealing something about himself. Jesus was also revealing something about Peter. Did Peter get the message? I think so. Look at verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. What did Peter see? 
he saw this miracle that Jesus did. And in seeing the miracle, he saw this is the kind of person this man really is. Who commands the fish of the sea? When Peter saw Jesus for who he really was, or when he glimpsed, let's put it that way, because as we go through, go on through the Gospels, we see that this wasn't always cemented in Peter's mind or the rest of the disciples' mind. There's some learning and growing that had to happen. But at least here, he gets this glimpse of who Jesus really is, and he then sees himself for who he really is. I'm not even worthy for you to, to be sharing a boat with me. You need, to, you need to get away from me because if you really are who I think you are, I should not be allowed to relate to you. I'm not good enough to be here with you, Jesus. Peter's second response was to repent, to say, Lord, I'm not, a, I'm not a good person. I'm not good enough to be in your presence. And actually, this is a, a common reaction we find elsewhere in the scripture from people who see God for who he really is. In Isaiah, uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, in, in chapter 6, it says that he saw God high and lifted up on his throne. The train, the train of his robe was filling the temple with glory, and he sees all these wonderful things. And you know what his response is? Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. When he sees God for who he really is, he sees himself for who he really is, and he's like, wow, I can't, I can't be here. I'm not good enough. Have we glimpsed Jesus for who he really is? Do we see ourselves in the light of who Jesus really is? See, this is, one of the, this is one of the things that God does when he brings about, when he starts to work change in our hearts, is that he, he starts to give us a correct perception of who he really is and of who we ourselves really are in relation to him. Perhaps if you share your faith with people, then they're not driven to repentance because they haven't really seen Jesus for who he really is. If all Jesus is, is a nice guy that lived 2,000 years ago and said and did some nice things, and he healed people, and, and you know, he told us to love our neighbor and all that, and, and then he died and whatever else, and, and you, know, you can trust in him and he's going to make your life so much better, if that's all it is, if it's, if it's just about me, going to heaven someday and, and feeling, feeling, having my life improved here, there's plenty of people around us, maybe even some of us, that think, well, I, my life's pretty good already. And actually the demands that Jesus makes on my life are going to mess things up. They're going to make it It unattractive for me to follow this guy. But when we see Jesus for who he is, the Son of God, who rules over everything, including my vocation, who has authority over all of creation, I start to say, you know what? I don't treat him that way. I've treated him like a nuisance that I need to forget about, that I need to get as far away from as I can because I want to do my own thing. And I start to see myself not as some good person who's at least better than that guy, but I start to see myself as the, the creature that has spurned his creator and turned away from him and gone my own way. I've worshipped something else other than him, the only one worthy of my worship. Perhaps I need to see Jesus more for who he really is 
Perhaps God wants me to see Jesus more for who he really is so that I will be driven to change in the ways that God calls me to. Jesus initiated this miracle with Peter and his companions in order to reveal who he really was in a way that would grip their hearts. And Peter responded rightly with, with obedience and with repentance. But notice that Jesus doesn't leave things there. He does one more thing, which is not just going to change Peter's heart, but his life forever. When Peter says, depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. It says he did this because he and those who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And the second part of, of verse 10 says this, Jesus said to Simon, yeah, you're right. You're going to pay now. Now. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching them. What is Jesus doing here? He is, he is comforting Peter in that moment of fear and recognition and repentance. But he's also commissioning him. He's commissioning him and saying, I'm giving you a, a new identity. Your life is about to change because you're going to follow me. And your vocation of fishing for, for fish, you're going to be fishing for, for people. You're going to be seeking to draw in people into my family, helping them to see me for who I really am, helping them to see themselves for who they really are. Jesus commissions Peter to a changed life, a changed identity. When God brings about change in someone's heart, it means a change in their purpose. It's not, it's not I live my life for myself, and now I've got my fire insurance that when I die, I'll go to heaven instead of hell. It's, I live my life now for the one who gave his life for me. And his action and my response to his action change everything in my life. And now when I go to work, when I go to school, when I'm, when I'm interacting with people, I'm doing it out of a sense that this this life that I'm living is not my life to live. It's, it's been given to me by my Savior who loves me, who gave himself up for me, and now I am driven to love him and, and to live in a way that he calls me to live. To live in a way that shows others what he is like. To live in a way that gives glory to him. Do you think Peter understood the gravity of the commission he had been given? I do, because we have verse 11, which tells us when they had brought in their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. You see, you see the response there? Jesus says, I'm in charge. You see me for who I really am. You, you, Surrender yourself to me in, in repentance and recognition, and now I'm going to set you loose with a renewed identity and a renewed commission. This is what your life will look like, and Peter follows. Because God has brought about this change in his heart. When when Peter, when it says here, Peter and his companions left everything to follow Jesus, do you think they understood everything that that would mean? Almost certainly not. They didn't know everything that Jesus was going to ask them to do. They didn't know how it was all going to end at that time. They didn't know everything. But when God changes your heart, you follow him without knowing the end. You don't know how everything is going to pan out in this life. We know the promise that he has given us that one day we will stand before him and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And we'll be welcomed into an eternity of perfect communion with him where we only, where we only get tastes of that communion in this life. But 
the disciples here show us what it looks like when God brings about change in your heart. You follow him, not always knowing the, how it's going to go. We see this illustrated later on in the Gospels when Jesus, Jesus said some crazy things about eating his body and drinking his blood. He was talking to the crowds in John chapter 6, and, and uh, it says many people left him that day. Because they were like, we, we don't know if we, we, we kind of just wanted like the loaves and fish, you know, we, we want as much food as we can eat, and we want miracles, and we want all that kind of stuff. But all this stuff about like, you know, becoming united, we, we don't know what you're talking about there. We don't really care about that. And Jesus says to his disciples, the 12, he says, are you guys going to leave too? I love Peter's response. He says, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You hear what he's saying there? He's not saying, Oh no, we understood what you said. We, 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 we got you. We're on the same page. No, it's like, Well, where else are we going to go? You're the one that has eternal life. We're certain of that. We have, we have known, we've come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we're certain about that. And some of these other things, we need to figure it out, but where else are we going to go? That's the way our lives are a lot of times, aren't they? A changed heart results in a changed life, and it's a walk of faith, not always knowing what God is up to. So what do we do with this? How does this example of God working in the hearts of people and the other disciples, how does this meet us where we're at? Well, first of all, I would, I would encourage you to adjust wrong perspectives that you may have about who Jesus is and about who you are. You see, we need to see Jesus for who he really is. We need to see ourselves in, properly in that light. It's that kind of proper perspective that allows us to do what, what Jesus said when, when he was instructing his disciples Forgive as you have been forgiven. Or love your enemies or whatever other things that was that he said that, that we might have a hard time with. When we see ourselves truly in relationship to God and say, I didn't deserve the forgiveness that he gave me. So maybe that changes the way that I can treat this other person who doesn't deserve Forgiveness. So often we have a small view of Jesus and a big view of ourselves. And God wants to correct that in us. The second thing that we need to think and we need to take away from this is that Jesus calls, Jesus initiates, Jesus is the one with authority, and we are the one who responds to him. And so are you responding? Are you answering his call to follow him completely? Are you... Maybe ask it this way. What change is God seeking to bring about in your heart today? Are you willing to be submissive to his spirit? If you've been given a new identity in Christ, a new commission, like Peter was, are you living into that identity? Are you living into the reality of who God has made you to be in Christ? If we could see Jesus more clearly for who he really is and ourselves for who we really are, and if we can embrace the identity and the commission that he gives us, imagine what our lives would look like. Imagine what our church would look like. Would I perhaps find the motivation for the selflessness that I'm called to show in Philippians 2, where Paul says, consider others more important than yourselves. Would I find the boldness to share about Jesus with my friends or my coworkers because I no longer see my own reputation at stake, but I, I see my identity tied to my Lord who loves me and commands me to follow him? Would my efforts to follow my Lord Jesus begin to flow not from a place of performance that I have to somehow stay good enough to stay in his good graces, but from a place of gratefulness because the God-man with whom I'm not worthy to share a boat has said, don't be afraid. I'm commissioning you. That sort of life is possible when God brings about change at a heart level. 
And that's the sort of life that we are invited into by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, make these things sink into our hearts more and more that we might be changed at the heart level because of what you are doing. Make us sensitive to the movement of your spirit. Make us obedient to you, even when we don't know the end, like Peter didn't know the end. Thank you, Lord, that we can rely on you to bring about change. In Jesus' name. As most of you know, in, in just about three weeks, uh, we have our semi-annual congregational meeting. And at that time, all of you who are members will be voting on whether or not to proceed to call me as the next senior pastor here at Bethany. So as you prayerfully approach that day, the elders asked me to get up and, and say a few words uh, to outline sort of my vision for the church. So you might have an idea of basically what you're voting for. Um, on June 23rd. I want to take a few minutes to outline what God has been putting on my heart as I've been prayerfully taking steps toward that senior pastor position here. And I would love to, to chat more with you about these things. Um, probably the best way for us to interact with questions that you might have in a more corporate way would be if you write them down and give them to me or, or hand them in at the church office or something like that. And next week I will try to address whatever questions I can um, uh, but I'm certainly willing to talk one-on-one -on -one if you, if you want to uh, chat with me about these things. But next Sunday, I will try to address whatever written questions and things come in. Uh, just don't wait until Saturday night to send me your questions. So, yeah, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Or Sunday morning. That's the other thing. <laughs> next Sunday morning, I get a pocket full of... Okay, let's see here. I got uh, Am I going to put an ice cream machine in it? Uh, so what is my vision for Bethany BFC? Well, it's basically that we would be the kind of church that we are told to be in the Bible. Uh, that we would be a family of believers in Jesus Christ, a family in which every person, no matter their age or their race or their position in life, they are taught and given opportunities to do three things. Glorify and worship God, to care for and build each other up, and to share our Savior with those around us. That's the big picture kind of what. If you're a fan of alliteration, you could say we're called to exalt the Savior, edify and equip the saints, and evangelize the lost. And some have, have put it that way. I didn't come up with that myself. That's the big overall what. And what I cannot give you, what I'm not going to pretend to give you, is all of the specific hows. How is that going to be done? What is that always going to look like for the next 20 years? Or however long the Lord tarries, or whatever. The how question, the different ways that we do these things will come and go throughout the years as they always have. I'm not going to pretend to have a couple of key programs up my sleeves which will grow the church to 700 members in five easy steps. <laughs> so if that's what you're looking for, then don't vote for me in, in a couple of weeks. But by, by the way, I, I don't believe... Sorry. I'm not even sure that that is really the point of why we get together here. <laughs> is it all about? We gotta get to that free service mark, you know? Or a larger building, or whatever it is. But anyway. I'm not, I'm not trying to get too specific about all the hows, but I do believe there is one key area that God has been putting on my heart and in the hearts of our elders and, and other ministry leaders recently, and that's the area of discipleship. Discipleship is one of the key areas that I plan to focus on, uh, at least to start off here, we, because we have a commission from our Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples, and I think if we make discipling people 
The central focus, it'll bring a lot of clarity to the questions of how and why and when we do different programs. I think if we're focusing on the discipleship of people, we will always make sure, we'll try to make sure our programs are serving to grow our people instead of looking for people to grow our programs. I think if we're, if we're focusing on discipleship of people, then we'll be able to train up the next generation, give them leadership in our committees and our elder and deacon boards, and, and that is something that we need to be doing, as we have talked about. If we're focusing on discipling people, it will enable our, our committees, perhaps, when they're planning activities, to always be asking the question, how can we reach that, that person or those people who are falling through the cracks of our current ministry programs? It can't just be about programs, it has to be about people. And I've seen Howard and Mita, as, as well as elders and other church members, exercising, modeling this kind of focus on people and on discipling them. So I'm not talking about an area that is like total failure, and it's like, here I am to save the day and get us back on track with discipleship. No, I'm talking about, I want, I want to see God developing a culture among us where every single person says, it's my job as a follower of Jesus Christ to be discipled by him and by the people that he's placed in my life and to be discipling somebody else, that I can be training up somebody else and helping them to grow in their faith. I'm talking about how I believe God is calling us to build upon a legacy of those who have gone before us. And that means asking hard questions, which get us out of our comfort zones and bring greater glory to him, as well as greater life change in ourselves and those around us. One last point that I'll make in closing, and you know this, this church, this family of believers doesn't belong to me. Doesn't belong to you either doesn't belong to Pastor Howard. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who said, I will build my church in Matthew 16, 18. And he is the one who gives us our marching orders as we go forward from here. The question is whether or not we're listening. And that is why I'm renewing my commitment to prayer. I'm committing to pray for each and every one of you. And I'm committing to be a catalyst among our elders and our committees, always reminding us of our need to approach our Heavenly Father and seek His guidance on the corporate decisions that need to be made in the days and months and years ahead. The what is clear. The family of God throughout all time is called to glorify Him, to build each other up, to reach out to the world. But the how, the specific ways in which God is calling us to do those things here in our context in Hatfield, Pennsylvania in the year 2019, those things need to be directed by our Lord, and that means we need, it ought to be our goal always to be sensitive to the movement of His Spirit. I like the way that uh, one pastor and author, Eugene Peterson, puts it. He says, a pastor is a sinner among the community who has the responsibility to keep the community attentive to God. That's my overarching commitment. In whatever I do, to strive to be attentive to God and to help all of us be attentive to God as well. Well, that's my spiel. And as I said at the beginning, I welcome conversation about these things. If you want to write a note, uh, questions that you have or whatever, uh, please feel free to do that. You can come talk to me as well. So that is uh, our, our semi-annual meeting is coming up in uh, in just a little bit here. Uh, I believe it's two weeks away. Is that right? Three. Three weeks away. All right. Three weeks away. Um, please check out your bulletin. There's information on stuff we'll be voting on there, not just not just transition stuff. There are announcements in there. We welcome you back tonight. Uh, if you would like to come back tonight and, and uh, join in discussion on God's Word and what it means, uh, we are going through a series called Thriving in Babylon, and it's a very discussion-oriented kind of thing, so I invite you to come out tonight at 6 o'clock for that. The Baby Bottle Boomerang is still going on. It's going on until Father's Day Sunday in a couple of weeks. All the money collected for that goes to the Pregnancy Resource Clinic of North Penn, so I encourage you to be involved. 
Our men of Bethany are going to an Iron Pigs game at the end of the month, Friday 20, the 28th. So please sign up for that in the lobby. There's a sign-up sheet out there. And uh, you can find other announcements and things in the bulletin. But we will stop there. Let's stand together as we give a, a benediction and, and go out from here to be Christ's hands and feet. And now may the God of grace, who has saved us, redeemed us, given us a new identity in his Son, Jesus Christ, by faith, may he empower you to go from here and to be his agents of redemption in the world around you. Amen. 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 Amen.